All right. I know uh, Mark was not going to be able to make it. He emailed me, told me he had uh, thrown his back out, but won't be able to make it tonight. Uh, does anybody know about Susan? Right, that's correct. And 
And just one correction, it's supposed to have an August 11th date, not August 12th. Sorry. That's okay. That was my typo. But um, yeah, I mean, as we uh, mentioned in the last meeting, uh, we had a range, and then we decided to take the average between the range so that um, uh, we, we, we saw it as being possibly as well as 13 and as high as 20, so that's where it came up to 17. Okay. Because so. that was my concern. I want to make sure that we're, you know, because we have a budget of 10000 that's already, by this budget, $7,005 over. So, and I know that when we're going along, especially with the marketing and, and brochures and stuff like that, you know, hopefully we get better prices and, you know, obviously keep our questions succinct to the lawyer so it doesn't run up to his five year old. Yeah, that's, that's the idea behind it, so. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? Oh, I'm sorry. Greg? Well, I was just going to say that in view of the fact that we really aren't at any spot, I guess we go see we've reached the website expenses to a certain extent. Uh, but um, it's all subject to change. So I would just say that if you if you wanted a, a motion to approve it, I would make a motion to approve it. You know, with the understanding, of course, that we know they are probably the budget that are going. Yes. That is a that is formal motion. We have a second. Formal. We have a second. Any other? Uh, we'll open it up for further comments. Then. Again, it's Greg. Go ahead, Jason. I just want to say that I'm. I mean, I'm very pleased personally with the budget subcommittee and the efforts that the whole this commission has has done to uh, be good stewards of tax dollars. I know I really appreciate. It. I'm sure this committee appreciates it, and uh, I think that. Uh, Any other comment then? Seeing that we have a motion, a second on the floor, um, Lisa, will you call the vote, please? Michael McDonough? Yes. Mary Jane Van Busker? Yes. Jim Major? Yes. Charlotte Wilson? Yes. Jason Green? Yes. Ken Emerson? Yes. Greg Walters? Yes. Steve Gunther? Yes. Lisa Emerson, yes. Sandra Hartwell? Yes. Ted Bowman? Yes. All right. At this time, uh, I'm also going to, uh, as part of the package of the budget subcommittee and the uh, actual budget, preliminary budget that was approved, uh, I had a list of uh, an introductory outline for legal services for actual review of the charter once we uh, get into it. Uh, again, this is just a uh, beginning outline for the services when we hire a uh, charter attorney to review the process. Um, I think you can see the document. I'm hanging up here. Does <laughs> everybody see it? Right, see it. Okay. It's the very last page of the three pages that are stapled together. But anyway, it, it's, it's just a beginning point of outlining what services we're going to be asking for from, for the attorney. And uh, some things are obviously are probably going to change from there, but I always like to work from an outline in producing any kind of document. So uh, the one thing I did find out was when you Google legal services for city charters, there are quite a few of them out there, and they they range uh, from scope of work anywhere from almost donated services. I've seen them as high as two hundred thousand dollars for legal services, but in those cases, the city are hired a charter attorney to actually review all the city documents and ordinances prior to the drafting of the charter, which obviously was taking an awful lot of time. And in our case, we were brought in and elected to do that uh, ourselves and produce the document for the attorney to review. So, yes? Um, are we going to put an RFP up, a request for proposal for this? Yes. Oh, we are. Okay. And that will be through the city? That, that's one of the questions I have. I mean, uh, since they will probably be, I, I'm not absolutely clear on if it'll actually go through the city or through the Charter Commission. Uh, okay. 
you know, that's one of the things that we'll have to talk to Teresa about. Okay. All right. Thank you. So anyway, it's just an outline, and uh, I'll be um, uh, I'll be talking with Teresa this week to try to find out the answer to that question uh, because it will make a difference on how it's written. Do you have any other Is there any other old business that we need to address? Yes, Greg. I'm not sure if this falls under the arena of old business, but it's something that, that I got out this weekend and a conversation I had with Mr. Green. Um, I was saying, I was considering, I wanted to know why our meetings are not on YouTube. And he said, well, they are. And we counted them. But to find them, you have to go under Brenda Gustafsson, not the city of Raytown, not charter meetings, to find them on YouTube. And I think that it would make a lot of sense. I don't know why it's, it's just not being put under the city of Raytown to begin with, but it would be appreciated, I know by me and I think probably other people on this commission, that it would be on the city's website, they would link those meetings to the website so that people can see what's going on at the meetings. I've had people ask me, well, how's it going, what's going on, because they don't have any news. Uh, they don't have any way to find out exactly what's being said, what's happening to me. So, I don't know who you want to send out. I will suggest Steve takes it to whoever. I'll talk with Teresa about that and see if we can get that on there. And I might want to find out if you would for me why it's being put under a private citizen's name rather than uh, the city of Raytown. Because it simply does not make any sense. I mean, if you want to keep it a secret, you do it that way. If you want people to know about it, you put it on the website. Let's see, right now, maybe these two find. Maybe some of the older men up here might know. Yeah, sure. Well, she is the public information officer, so she is the one who distributes information about the city. So that's why it's done that way. Um, I think there, you know, if I, I know that the um, papers follow it, and they can put a link, you know, that you can type in and get it to it if you wanted to, um, to be able to follow that. It's, you know, there's a lot of process to download. What I understand is a lot of process to download the video into the link that goes to YouTube. No. To create a link is uh, is so simple that I could almost do a blindfold. Well, that's probably because you have a lot of experience. I didn't even know no, all, all but you have to do is a little thing that says what do you want to call it, put the link there, and when people go to the page, say on the, like the home page of the city of Raytown, they double click on it, it takes them straight to the show. Well, we'll just have to check into it. I'm sure Steve will do that. Yeah, I, I think, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, Greg, but the city of Raytown has its very own YouTube account. And um, your complaint is that it's going on somebody's personal account for an official meeting. And it's not a difficult process to put it on the city's official uh, YouTube account because Otherwise, the problem you run into is if she's not the PR person next year, suddenly all of her, our um, city data is stored on her personal computer and she can do whatever. She can delete the link and we'll never have it again, for instance, if something were to go badly um, or the data was lost. Um, it's not in the city's possession on its own account, I think is the issue. Um, my concern is I just want to make it easy for people who are interested to look it up. Uh, we're limiting what we can broadcast here. Mr. Downey's making it. No, I'm sorry. Actually, the city has a copy of DVD quality. On Raytown Online, mine is Blu-ray quality. It's always posted first. I burn them a disc and they upload a DVD. So it's lower. There are two copies out there under her and under Raytown. Well, actually, it's political 1950, but the actually better version is not the city's version because... No, I understand that there are your versions that are, that I, I, I looked at them last night on Google, they're all there. Yeah. I, I mean, on the, on YouTube. Yeah. But the problem is that people do not know where to go look for them. And this way, if we make it part of our public documents the city hall, it certainly makes it easy for them to do it. It's not hard to do. You know? we'll just embed the code. Yes. 
we will definitely look into that. Um, any other old business then before we move on to new business? Seeing none, uh, we will proceed into new business and we will start up with Article 3, Section 3.10, Legislative Proceedings, Item P. E. Jason. Uh, yes, and um, from my notes here, uh, it looks like we maybe we were having a discussion on this and some words were maybe being changed. So I'm just going to, I, I, we never completed that discussion last meeting, so I'm just going to go ahead and read what what I originally wrote and uh, get up from there if everyone's fine with that. That's fine. Okay. All right, so we're on 3.10 legislative proceedings. Uh, section E procedure. This is except in the case of emergency ordinances. Every proposed ordinance shall be read by title in open board meetings two times before final passage. At least one week shall elapse between the introduction and final passage. A copy of each proposed ordinance shall be provided for each alderman at the time of its introduction. A copy shall be provided by the city clerk for inspection by the people a copy in the office of the city clerk. Until it is finally adopted or fails in adoption, people interested in a proposed ordinance shall be given an opportunity to be heard before the Board of Aldermen in accordance with such rules and regulations as the Board may adopt. If the Board adopts an amendment to a proposed ordinance that constitutes a change in substance, any member of the Board may require that the proposed ordinance as amended be place on file for inspection by the people in the office of the city clerk for an additional week before final passage. In the absence of such request, the board may consider the amended ordinance at the same meeting. Um, this has been consistent with um, several other charters, and that's, that's where this came from. Uh, it seems like the language is, is very consistent, in fact, with this procedural uh, one. So. And I think what... Um I had asked Lisa to put in some additional things because we were having the discussion at the last meeting and I was just trying to address some of those discussion items. Uh, the big one, I mean, the big, the big discussion that they uh, centered around whether an article should be read in its entirety or not. And so I was trying to find a solution to that. Uh, and I asked uh, Lisa to uh, add uh, from your, uh, from what you read, uh, after by title, to include an introductory summary. Yeah. Okay. And then uh, after uh, between introduction and final passage to address, you know, uh, what we were debating as an alderman can demand the ordinance to be read in its entirety. Uh, I asked that there would be a, uh, an option to that, that an alderman may request that the majority consent of the Board of Aldermen that the ordinance be read in its entirety, which would give the entire board a chance to, to vote on it. You couldn't just have one person demanding it. And because the length of some of these ordinances and everything is incredibly long, and they could take, I wouldn't want to be the person, but let's put it this way. Mr. So, Hager brought up a point to me last week about you know the 2012 International Code. That would probably take <laughs> read its entirety, maybe I don't know six to eight hours. No, no, I don't know how long, but it was some time, wasn't it, Jim? So I guess what I'm asking you, Jason, is would you be willing to add that? Yeah, one of those words. Yes, the two points you mentioned about adding to read by title and summary, and then the second section about uh, the, uh, an alderman may request. Uh, with the majority consent of the, the board to, to have it read in its entirety. I think those are good compromises in terms of the discussion we had. I made notes of both of those on, on that. I just went ahead and read the original copy so that I didn't want to wait for confusion to make folks think that something was added when it wasn't. All right. Thanks, Jason. And I know that I, I, came, I did this because I know Greg was wanting to have the entire ordinance possibly read, so I didn't know how if this maybe. Address your concerns, Greg, as far as reading of the 
Okay. No, and, and I may go ahead. Okay. The sentence that you're adding here in Alderman may request that the majority consent of the Board of Aldermen that an ordinance be read in its entirety does not address it. And that is because of something that typically called in the old days, we call the tyranny of the majority. And that is that it's easy for the majority of the 10 member board to say no to one member. And as was discussed at the last meeting, the reason we put in an alderman can demand more than to be read in its, in its entirety would be in response to constituent wishes. In most cases, from my experience, I had a lot of experience up in these meetings, the only time you will see something like this possibly used would be if you have a zoning question that is controversial. And sometimes elected officials lose sight of the fact that the reason you have zoning hearings and public hearings on zoning questions is to be able to air all of the information out there. If everybody up here at this DS has a copy of the ordinance, and the rest of the world is supposed to share one copy that's left on that table over there, it's not really an equal playing field. And this would allow the public to have some recourse to be able to hear the thing said in its entirety. That's why it's important that you allow that, that, uh, that exception. And that was actually, to my, to my memory, in the last meeting, the original suggestion, I think, by Ms. Emerson here, was uh, to say that the ordinance will be read in its entirety the first time it's read. Not in Kansas. Okay. And, um, and it, it, we, we walked away from that in some ways because there were some people who just simply did not want to have the ordinance read in its entirety. And some of them are matters that are housekeeping matters, so I can understand that. However, the portion about an alderman can demand the ordinance be read in its entirety was placed in there so that it makes certain that his constituents are allowed to understand and to hear what's going on so that they can become a part of the process. If you leave it up to, and I, I, I don't do this myself personally, and some of you will that have been on the city council have to, to see where somebody needs to be heard and they're not allowed to be heard because the rules don't allow for it. Okay. And it's, that's, that's why you want to be able to allow an alderman to demand the ordinance be read in this entirety. All right, well, I think uh, we have several other current board of aldermen and several other people that would like to speak on this. Uh, I don't want to get into the long debate because we have a lot of things, so we partially debated this last uh, session. I'm going to, I didn't see you two first. Uh, I did see Jim. Uh, I'll go to Jim and Lisa, and then I'll just work my way around if that's okay with you two over there. Go ahead, Jim. It's been said, and I don't necessarily agree with this, that you give an alderman the option to operate at his worst, he'll do it. And uh, we've heard that before on this chart commission. And this is a good example where if an alderman wanted to choose to use the ordinances as a filibuster to do that, for example, the animal codes or the international trade codes, which wouldn't take hours, but regular months to read, because you're looking at thousands and thousands of pages. And if you give the alderman the option to say, I demand you do this, then you must do it. You can lock up the legislation of the city for months. That's the drawback. And it's not just that particular one. There are other ordinances. If you did it again, ordinance after ordinance, you, you would literally tie up the city just because um, an alderman chooses to do that. So that's why we're opposed to it. Two things. Um, Greg, so the first sentence that read there would be available to you? The title introductory somewhere. Uh, and oh, the first thing: Alderman can demand the ordinance be read in its entirety. I, I think it's a, it's a good idea, and, and uh, I disagree with what Mr. Asher just opined. That the, I have never seen board members act in that manner. I've never seen a thousand-page ordinance either. And uh, uh, the code, of the, the one on the animal control, which I helped write, uh, infamously probably in some people's mind, that thing is only about six pages long. And that was a good example of one that the public certainly did want to hear every syllable of it. And uh, I, I would also um, be in favor of having an alderman uh, demand that it be read if 
wanted, uh, not only because of the tyranny of the majority, but because I think it would be a good check on too long of leg and detailed legislation, frankly. Um, because if it goes, if your legislation lasts 100 pages, maybe that's a good reason to cut it down. So, um, also, on another note, Jason, um, what you were reading from differed from the last Article 3 document I got from you um, in a few words, and so I wanted to make sure we were all on the same page there. Um, I was wondering which version you're using, because I don't think I have that one. It's the same version I've always used. I mean, I, what happened with this, the one that I, uh, that I spoke with and <coughs> with uh, Steve about, and, you know, this is the one I submitted last week. I just didn't read the, uh, the, word, the stuff that we talked about yesterday, or not yesterday, but um, last week, I should say. Okay, well, my, my copy of this is the same, it's the same version I had last week. So, yeah. And he didn't read the red stuff, he just read. Okay. okay. All right. I'm going to see if you can go ahead. I read about the minutes today, and it says Jason Green reads 3.10e. There's discussion, Lisa Emerson motions to approve, but without the words of by title stricken. And uh, Greg seconds, and then there's further discussion, but there is no vote. Right. So, are you, you still have, by title, are you leaving it or not? Well, we, we've never voted on it. I don't think we voted on the that. Right. Well, I think maybe a friendlier way to phrase this might be an alderman can reserve the right to have the ordinance read in its entirety instead of demand. just pointed out to me on the second to last line of the minutes that there was a 0 to 12 vote to take that out. Now, I could not pass that. Mary Jane made a motion to adjourn after the 10-3-D and that there is nothing between that and, and the end of it. Where it says motion passed 10 to 2 but the five to adjourn. Okay, Mary, Mary Jane, you're saying uh, instead of the man reserve the right? An alderman can reserve the right to have the ordinance read in its entirety. That's the motion I was saying. Well, I mean, I think we're still in discussion. I mean, the motion can be made, but I mean, uh, no, there is. There is no motion yet on the table. I did not hear somebody say this. a motion. Okay. All right. She was just making suggestion to possible wording. Well, it's one suggestion. Okay. Any other comments? Yes. Yes. Yeah. In. Uh, I, I understand the filibuster concern, and I think. I, I can see somebody trying to pull that, but I don't know that I don't know that it's impossible for somebody to uh, call a special meeting to do that reading. Is that practical, Greg? When you have all the people here at a, at a public hearing specifically for the purpose of, let's say, a zoning question, and say you come back tomorrow and then we'll read it to you. Well, that's my point. That's yeah. That, that is inconvenient. Well, it's inconvenient. Should we have the board come back with them? No, I, I, I doubt that they would. What, yeah. what, what I'm trying to do is find center ground. It also doesn't mention it here. Um, I, I agree with your concern about one printed copy being set out. We, we have and have had for some time the technology to publish these things 
privacy, privilege, power, reserved right. Um, can we do privilege or power since it's not technically a right? But we're using that specifically at the beginning of the document to. They believe that right is the lawyer wants to change it again. Okay. Yes. I believe that the city is now charging people if they want copies of things. And I've had several people in my board very upset because they charge them per copy for any undocuments they want. So now it's just terrible. ordinances or maybe copies of stuff kind of planning? I do not know, but I know they're charging for copies of something. Because I know that they get something in a, like a city map or something like that from planning that they charge for that, but I mean, I'm not sure if they actually charge for an ordinance or not. Right. Well, I kind of had a comment when Mr. Age was saying about people can come up and get copies. That's true. However, some people have had troubles getting copies and they resort to using the Freedom of Information Act. When that happens, I believe those copies by law are free. However, to get something for the Freedom of Information Act, you have to put it in writing. You have to put a bunch of hoops to do it. So it's not just like you come up and say, hey, I'd like to have a copy of that and say, sure. And give you a smile and say, have one. No, it doesn't work that way. And I go back to the Walmart fiasco a couple years ago when stuff was unearthed about the, uh, you know, about meetings that went on, who was at meetings, when people were saying they didn't have any knowledge of the, of the, of the uh, Walmart project going on, and yet it turned out through the Freedom of Information Act, documents were found in people attending meetings discussing it months before. So it's not really all that open. It's open because of a federal law in any one case, but I think that it's important that we do include these, uh, these questions for ordinances and so forth for people free of charge. All right, well, I'm, I'm just trying to stay up on this, so, Charlie. I have a question when you say, um, all retired print copies in electronic and print forms will be without charge, whatever it was, provided by the city clerk without charge. Electronic, does that mean on a DVD kind of thing? Or what? What is the electronic? Because it's already on the website. I, I think that's what you meant was the thing. You have to ask Jason. Jason? Yes. With the, when you put electronic in there, it is I mean, we're already providing it electronically on the website. Is that what you're referring to? Or they have to copy and download onto this? Well, it just says copy shop provide electronic <laughs> form. So, I mean, if, you know, if you, yeah, if you, you can go on my house and get electronic forms. So right. That would suffice. But, you know, I just wanted to ensure that, <sighs> I felt that if you had that, it, it would make this mission. Even if, even if the city already does it, I felt that this commission would be quote unquote pacified by any, some of the concern that you had inside. Okay, so really the. But you don't, need, you don't need a copy of it, it just needs to be made available electronically. So you, yeah, so it's like. Which is the city, it's already right. Right. Yeah, yeah, but we're just putting it in the chart. Right. Mm -hmm. All right, if you want to make an well, attempt to. I think, um, correct me if I'm wrong, I think Mr. Bowman may have. Except in the case of emergency ordinances, every proposed ordinance shall be read by title and introductory summary at open board of aldermen meetings two times before final passage. At least one week shall elapse between introduction and final passage. An alderman can reserve the right to have an ordinance read in its entirety. A copy of each proposed ordinance shall be provided for each alderman at the time of its introduction. Copies in print and electronic forms shall be made available for inspection by residents of the city, including a copy in the office of the city clerk without fee or charge until it is finally adopted or fails in adoption. People interested in a proposed ordinance shall be given an opportunity to be heard before the Board of Aldermen in accordance with such rules and regulations as the Board of Aldermen may adopt. If the Board of Aldermen adopts an amendment to a proposed ordinance that constitutes a change in substance, 
Any member of the Board of Aldermen may require that the proposed ordinance as amended be placed on file for inspection by the people in the office of, sit of the city clerk for an additional week before final passage. In the absence of such a request, the Board of Aldermen may consider the amended ordinance at the same meeting. The changes that I, that I read in there included the reserve, the right versus demand, and the copies in print and electronic form, and, I, and we also altered res, uh, people to residents of the city. Those of those who didn't provide that free of charge. Uh, I stuck the free of charge in there. I can read that sentence again if the secretary can do that. Okay, so after provided by the city clerk for inspection by the residents instead of people? Copies in print and electronic forms shall be provided for the city clerk for inspection by the residents of the city. Without fee or charge. Can I ask anything? Yes, Lisa, go ahead. Okay, let me make sure I got this right. A copy of each proposed ordinance shall be provided for each alderman at the time of its introduction. Copies in electronic and print form shall be provided by the city clerk for inspection by the residents of the city. Without fee or charge. Without fee or charge. Okay. Including a copy in the office of the city clerk until it is finally approved, adopted, or fails in adoption. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. Um, I like we had a discussion about um, the preamble and being using specific wording. Um, I agree that we probably, if we have a definition section, should put residents in there if we're doing that, um, just so we keep it straight. Residents of the city. The city is Raytown. People can be anybody, um, as we discussed before, um, but in the preamble and other uh, sections, when we're talking about rights, we're using that in a very specific manner, and I don't think it would be a good idea to change the definition halfway through in the stream of things. So I would, again, request that we change um, an alderman can reserve the right to, the alderman can reserve the privilege. Yeah, but it, uh, well, I can make it. They take her comment. Are you taking her comment? Uh, or what Ted gave it and her interpretation sounded almost exactly alike to me. So, I, if that's, if I didn't understand her change. The only thing that she was changing was instead of reserve the rights, she says she's going to say reserve the privilege to have. I was saying privilege because, as we discussed earlier, with um, having specific definitions, um, we were using right in a specific way earlier in the document, so to change it midstream um, to something else is, is a little bit odd because aldermen, just by the position of aldermen, do not have special rights versus other citizens. It's just a privilege. All right, Mary Jane. If you, if you want to reserve it, stay with right, then that's fine. All right. I think if we keep changing and picking and nitpicking, we're never going to move on past 310E tonight. We have, we're going to hire a lawyer. The lawyer will go through the document and make the necessary changes. And I think we need... Well, they'll make, they'll make suggestions, yes. We still have to make the final changes, yeah. But I, I, think, I think it's fine the way it is. I think most should be accepted as is. All right. Uh, all right. There's been a motion and a second. Any other discussion, Jim? Yeah. The um, one comment I would make is that just so everybody understands, when we prepare for a meeting, that the city is going to make hundred copies of every ordinance. Uh, what they do is a person calls up, requests it, they run it off, and then they go pick it up. But they don't just make multiple copies and lay them on the counter for people to pick up. I don't think that's what they're intended for. No, I know that. Uh, and that's a, but it's important that we do understand that because if the city, that would be a great expense. And there was a time we did do that. And over a period of time, we tried to cut expenses. Okay. Lisa, one last comment. I motion to amend to privilege.
Lynch for writing. Lisa's making a motion to amend what we currently have to reserve the privilege to have versus reserve the right to have. And we will need to second before we Janet yeah, seconds. So we'll have to have a roll call vote on that possible change. If that does not pass, then we will go back to the word right versus privilege. And we will vote on that. All right. Lisa, is that clear? Is that clear, everybody? Okay. Lisa, go ahead and call the vote. Greg Walters. No. Sandra Harper. No. Charlotte Nelson. No. Steve Gunther. No. Ted Melvin. No. Joyce Andrea. No. Jim Asia. No. Susan Dolan. Michael McDonough. No. Mark Moore. Mary Jane Van Busker. No. Janet Emerson. Yes. Lisa Emerson, yes. All right. Uh, that motion does not pass. Uh, I think it was two to nine. All right. We'll back, we're back to leaving it as reserve the right. That motion is on the table and seconded. Can we have a roll call vote to that, please? shall be read by title and introductory summary and open board of alderman meetings two times before final passage. At least one week shall elapse between introduction and final passage. An alderman can reserve the right to have an ordinance read in its entirety. A copy of each proposed ordinance shall be provided for each alderman at the time of its introduction. Copies of electronic and print form shall be provided by the city clerk for inspection by the residents of the city without fee or charge, including a copy of the office of the city clerk until it is finally adopted or fails in adoption. People interested in a proposed ordinance shall be given an opportunity to be heard before the Board of Aldermen in accordance with such rules and regulations that the Board of Aldermen may adopt. If the Board of Aldermen adopts an amendment to a proposed ordinance that constitutes a change in substance, any member of the Board of Aldermen may require that the proposed ordinance as amended be placed on file for inspection by the people in the office of the City Clerk for an additional week before final passage. In the absence of a such a request, the Board of Aldermen may consider the amended ordinance at the same meeting. Is that is that correct? Everybody okay with that? That's what we're voting on now. Please take the vote. Mary Jane Van Buster. Yes. Steve Gunther. Yes. Janet Emerson. Yes. Charlotte Wilson. Yes. Mark Moore. Oh, Jim Asia. Yes. Greg Walters. Yes. Ted Bowman. Yes. Jason Green. Yes. Sandra Hartwell. Yes. Michael McDonough. Yes. Lisa Emerson. No. I believe that passes 10 to 1. All right, we'll move on to Jason and item F under 3.10. Item F is emergency ordinances. It says an ordinance may be passed as an emergency measure on the day of its introduction, if it contains a declaration describing in clear and specific terms the facts and reasons constituting the emergency and receives the affirmative vote of two-thirds of the members, an ordinance granting, reviewing, or extending a franchise shall not be passed as an emergency ordinance. Um, again, this is it's not a broken record, but this has been kind of consistent language. Um, with many other charters. Um, I, I do want to make a comment though real quick. I, and I don't know if he wants to mention this or not. I do believe there's some version or a suggestion, maybe Ted, that you, you had in regards to this? Or? You know, I, I had this conversation with somebody. I, I, I'm sorry, I can't remember what that was. <laughs> <laughs> well, neither do I. So. <laughs> uh, I'd say well, hey. All right. <laughs> Discussion. We have a motion. Second. Jason seconds. Any other discussion? Lisa, can we take a vote, please? Yes. Sorry. Just to 
double check that I'm correct. Emergency ordinances, F. An ordinance may be passed as an emergency measure on the day of its introduction if it contains a declaration describing in clear and specific terms the facts and reasons constituting the emergency and receives the affirmative vote of two-thirds of the members. An ordinance granting, reviewing, or extending a franchise shall not be passed as an emergency ordinance. All right, Charlotte Wilson. Yes. Mark uh, Jemajor. Yes. Lisa Emerson, yes. Ted Bowman. Yes. Janet Emerson. Yes. Sandra Harbaugh. Yes. Mary Jane McCusker. Yes. Greg Walters. Yes. Michael McDonough. Yes. Steve Gunther. Yes. Jason Green. Yes. Let's go to Ivan G. Section 3.10, Ivan G, effective date. Authentication and reporting. Every adopted ordinance and resolution shall take effect and be enforced immediately unless a later effective date is expressly provided in the ordinance or resolution. Shall be authenticated by the mayor and the clerk. Shall be reported by the clerk as described in Article 5 of this chart. Um, these are this version. That's Saying though, and I don't want to put words in his. I mean, if, if we don't give the mayor the power of veto, then that portion is stricken out. We'll have to come up with some other language that uh, mentions that if he decides not to sign it, uh, then what happens then? Well, from what I read, it, it, it's as it is now. If the mayor decides not to sign it, then I think it's seven days later it goes into effect as if the mayor did sign it. And, and I know that's happened. How do we write this section G then? Can you just put in parentheses C section four, section such? Well, it's in section five. It's right. I think it's right. All right. Lisa's got a question too. So, okay. My question: um, Shall be authentic? You're just having a problem with the phrase "shall be authenticated by the mayor," right? Yes. Okay. Uh, Okay, here's the thing. Um, so, forward in the mayoral, mayoral section of the document, we have, we're going to split that to where we decide whether the mayor gets to have a veto or not. Now, um, if we decide, for instance, that he gets veto, this won't be a problem because we've already written in there that it will become law or whatnot seven days into it, even if he doesn't sign it. Um, but if we do say that he does not get a veto, this kind of 
nulls this phrase, as I understand it, unless there's um, a state statute stating that a mayor, there has to be a signature on something, right? Would it solve it to just take the word the mayor out of there? I don't know if that's a, see, that's what I don't know about state statute. Do they expect to have a mayor sign off on it and the city clerk or just the city clerk? Yeah, no, this is just talking about authenticating the thing after the legal Either the time has passed or the mayor has signed it. Somebody just needs to sign and say this is now. Right. So if the city clerk did that, it would theoretically be just fine. If if the city clerk signed it, if the city clerk signed off on it, it would be fine. I think so. Yeah. The city clerk's not the one that authorizes that it's a law, only that it happened. Okay. Um. And my other question is, uh, I think I can save that to the mayor thing we're talking about the day. Does that fix it, Greg? I, I guess. Um, we're, we're talking about authenticating what was made into law, not not how it becomes a law. I, I understand. That's that's the, the best argument I heard. Is that this is the form that you use right here. Um, I, it just it, I had not read it yet, and so I I, I wondered if we were by not having that in the same way. I mean, uh, Lisa's got one more question. I was just going to read a suggestion for the whole thing, if it sounds good. Um, if we take out, yeah. if we just said effective date and authentication, every adopted ordinance and resolution shall take effect and be enforced immediately unless a later effective date is expressly provided and the ordinance or resolution shall be authenticated by the city clerk. And if we just leave it there. Well, Go ahead. One, I mean, on there, because the mayor signs it or the mayor pro tem can sign it, so there's really always somebody available to sign off on that because the Board of Aldermen have already passed it, that's why it's being signed to go into effect. So, it, I don't think you need to take that out of it because you need to have that document signed. Authenticated. If, if the mayor doesn't authenticate it, when he fails to do that, it becomes law seven to ten days later anyway. Technically, he's still never signed it, so it's still not authenticated. Right, we're just doing housekeeping. Um, yeah, great. Well, what bothers me is I don't know what state laws govern the chief executive officer of the city and what powers, and, and you know, it may be that we don't have a choice. The mayor has to be on there. And about belaboring the point that we had an attorney here, we could get their answer real quick because we're kind of shooting in the dark on this. So, um, I personally, I think rather than spend a lot of time arguing about why we just leave it in advance and go forward, and then we can always come back and fix it later. And I know I've been against that earlier on other issues, but this is what I don't think we're, we're, there's any great disagreement on. It's just we just want to be right. Well, Okay, the next, the next thing that seems to be the, the debate, though, is the taking out of the word recording. I mean, how does recording actually, I mean, Jason, you read recording in the title and also in the last sentence, which I didn't get all written down. You want to read your last sentence again? Well, no. First off, there's a more condensed version over here, too, I didn't say it, but anyway. Um, let's see here. This, this, yeah, this is shall be recorded by the clerk as described in Article 5 of this charter. Yeah, correct if I'm wrong. If, yeah, I guess it will be Article 5 for the city clerk section there. So. But is that kind of redundant? We're already saying she's authenticating it? Could be. I mean, that, that, that's my question. Yeah. I'm fine with the little bit. Why not just put authenticated and made by the, the mayor and city clerk? And maybe put uh, and file. And then it will cover it when you get to the mayor and the city clerk. 
Okay, so you want to give Lisa a suggestion on how you would actually read that then? No, I would just do provided in the ordinance or resolution shall be authenticated, period. Oh, and filed. And then, and filed. And that would cover that, and then when you get to the mayor and the city clerk, then you have all the information that you need. Okay, Lisa, you want to read what you think she was? G, effective date and authentication. Every adopted ordinance and resolution shall take effect and be enforced immediately unless a later effective date is expressly provided in the ordinance or resolution shall be authenticated and filed. So it's, yeah. Jim, I, I, the only thing I would add to that is the purpose of authenticating is to make sure that, that once it reaches, uh, it goes past the board, that whatever version they get is the one they indeed had the night before. To make sure all the wording is correct and nothing's been changed. That's the purpose. It's a simple purpose, not meant to be tricky. So is there a suggestion that we Table this or just approve it as stupid and come back. So, okay. I'll remember. <laughs> <laughs> oh, <thank> <laughs> <coughs> All right, so is there a motion then on the table? Yes. Steve Gunther? Yes. Charlotte Nelson? Yes. Jim Major? 